And following on from the story uh, that we did earlier, uh, Jesus is standing there and there's still a big crowd round watching what's going to happen next. I don't know about you, but I was thinking about how I would have responded to that um, first incident. All these people bring this woman and the question is, what are you, what are you saying about this? What are you going to do here? You know, we like to think we would have done the right thing. But so often when the pressure's on and people are, are, are chipping away at you, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? What are you going to do? It, it's, you know, in, in that kind of moment, very often it's at that moment that we get the choice wrong. You could argue the ins and outs of this story. You know, they've come and said, uh, the law of Moses says this woman should be stoned. That's only partly true. The law of Moses says they both, man and woman, should have been stoned. But where's the man in the story? What happened to him? There's no sign of him. Because they had the easy option. The man might have fought them. Was it a setup? They had certainly been watching because they knew what was going on. I mean, the whole thing is just really odd. And so they've come. And they've come condemning somebody else when they themselves have broken the law. And they don't see it because they are so full of this anger and trying to get Jesus. And then it says, Jesus stooped. Jesus stooped, low enough to sleep in a manger. Jesus stooped to work in a carpenter shop. Jesus stooped to sleep in a fishing boat. Low enough to rub shoulders with crooks and with lepers. Low enough to be spat upon, slapped, whipped, nailed, and speared. Low enough to be buried. But it didn't stop there. Because he stood up. Up from the slab of death, upright in Joseph's tomb and right in Satan's face. Right in the face of the one who would accuse. And he said, it's finished. Enough is enough. He stood up for that woman and he silenced her accusers. And he does the same for you and for me. In Romans chapter 8, verse 34, it says this, Jesus is even now in the presence of God at this very moment sticking up for us. What an incredible thought that is. Do you know what? I, I suspect you're kind of like me. I hope you're kind of like me because you would be really odd otherwise. But I suspect kind of like me, y you become conscious of those things that you do that you know you shouldn't do. And the accuser is the one who puts those thoughts in your head. Who are you to do that? What, what makes you think? And yet, Jesus today is standing in the presence of God the Father, saying, look at David. He's my child. Put your own name in there. Look at, she's my child. Because that's what he sees. He doesn't see the sin. He doesn't see all the other stuff. Because we've been forgiven. We've been set free and we've been made clean. 
Not because we, we merit it or deserve it, but because Jesus chose to do it for us. In the presence of God, in defiance of Satan, Jesus Christ rises to your defense. And he takes on the role of a priest. In Hebrews 10, 21 and 22, it says there, since we have a great high priest over God's house, let us come near to God with a sincere heart and a sure faith because we've been made free from a guilty conscience. Paul, writing the Ephesians, says that we can come into the presence of God in freedom and in confidence. And here this author says we can come into the presence of God in freedom and in confidence. Why? Because we have been forgiven. If today you are a child of God who has been forgiven, you can come into the presence of God with freedom and confidence. The guilt is neither here nor there because God doesn't recognize it. What God recognizes is the Spirit of God in you, living and working in you. And when we come to him day by day and say, do you know, I've done this thing again, will you forgive me? The answer is always yes. God never says, well, do you know what? I've told you over and over and over again not to do that. What are you thinking of? He says, yes, I'll forgive you. A clean conscience, a clean record, a clean heart, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Not just for past mistakes, but also for future ones. Jesus trumps the devil's guilt with words of grace. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 5 to 10. Though we were spiritually dead because of the things we did against God, we were past tense. He gave us new life with Christ. You've been saved by God's grace. And he raised us up with Christ and gave us a seat with him in the heavens. And he did this for those in Christ Jesus so that for all future time, he could show the very great riches of his grace by being kind to us in Christ Jesus. I mean that you've been saved by grace through believing you didn't save yourselves. It was a gift from God. It was not the result of your own efforts so that you can't brag about it. God has made us what we are. Isn't that an amazing thing? Sometimes we look at ourselves and we think, oh, I don't like that bit. We could do a wee, a wee tuck here, a wee bit there, a wee, you know, or my personality is a wee bit, you know, I don't like that bit. God has made us who we are. And he has made us to do good works, which he planned in advance for us to live our lives doing. God has plans and purposes for you and for me. Good plans and purposes to do good works. And we do it because we have received grace. And we receive grace through faith in his son who died for us. So there's the fruit of grace. We are saved by God. We are raised by God. We are seated with God. We are gifted, equipped, and commissioned. So farewell to earthly condemnation. All the, the, you're stupid or unproductive or a slow learner or a quitter or a cheapskate or whatever else it is. There's no more of that. You are who Jesus says you are. You're spiritually alive. Heavenly positioned, connected to God, a billboard of mercy, an honored child. Satan then is left speechless and without ammunition. Romans chapter 8, 33 and 34 says this, Who can accuse the people that God has chosen? No one. Because God is the one who makes them right. Who can say God's people are guilty? No one. Because Christ Jesus died, but he was also raised from the dead, and now he is on God's right side, appealing to God for us. So the accusations of Satan sputter and fall like a deflated balloon. But then you say, so why? Why on earth do I still hear that voice? Why is it still in my head? Why is there still accusation? Not all guilt is bad. 
God uses appropriate doses of guilt to awaken us to sin. We know from His Word that God-given guilt causes indignation and alarm and a longing for Him, for concern and for readiness to see justice done in the world. It's the kind of guilt that draws us towards change and to become more like Jesus. Satan's guilt, on the other hand, brings only regret and enslavement. When God looks at you and me, He sees Jesus first. In the Chinese language, there's a character for righteousness, and it's actually a combination of two characters. It has the figure of a lamb and of a person, and the lamb is on top covering the person. And when God looks at you and at me, that's what He sees. He sees the perfect Lamb of God covering you and me. And so, in living our lives, it really boils down to this choice. Do you trust your advocate, the one who is before God pleading your case, or do you trust your accuser? This morning, I got up and our uh, former minister, Kenny Borthwick, um, has had to retire due to ill health. And his ministry now is through a blog that he writes. I want to read just a little bit of it uh, that, that came in this morning, and it was, it was uh, to preachers. And he's talking about the fact that sometimes when you're getting ready to preach or when you're preaching, there's a, an unease that you feel. And his word for today was actually this, rather your dis-ease is there as God's invitation to take other people into the waters that you yourself have tasted but held back from ministering in. You've been on deeper water yourself and looked into them with awe. You've glimpsed limitless love, limitless power, limitless wisdom, limitless faithfulness, a limitless unfaltering purposefulness and never altering righteousness and holiness and mercy. You've met with God, and we speak of what we know. So speak of what you know of the unchanging God of the Bible, who is the God of your experience too. God got you onto these waters, and He can get others there too. Just be a witness to speak of what you've seen and heard. Speak of what you know. It will help some to long to swim where they can't feel the ground beneath their feet. To swim in a place where they can't feel or see an edge or a bank to hold on to. To be in an open sea where they're aware of movement around them and underneath them over which they have no control and is beyond their knowledge. Some are longing for that place where they are out of their depth in God. If I have stood here and not spoken about Jesus, or if I have stood here and been judgmental, then I want to apologize for that. If I have stood here and told you things that are wrong, then I apologize for that. Because actually what I want to do is to speak about things I know. I want to tell you about Jesus. I want to tell you that He loves you. I want to tell you that He is full of grace and mercy and compassion. That there is nobody like Him. That there never has been anybody like Him. And if you don't know Him today, then you are missing out on on the best, most fulfilling relationship you can ever have. It's all about Jesus. Me, I, would have, I don't know what I'd have done to that woman, but here's an opportunity for Jesus to show grace. Of course, you can talk about all the fact he went and he said to her, go and change, go and don't do it again. Don't, there's hundreds of other stuff in this story, but you know what? The, the main fact of the story is that Jesus showed grace and compassion to somebody who didn't deserve it. None of us deserve it. None of us. And yet, it's freely offered. Freely offered. Jesus died on the cross for you and for me. 
so that we can be forgiven, so that we can receive grace. And sometimes I think that's kind of what I miss out on. And I think it's because as human beings, we so often judge sins to be better or not so bad as others. So we can have a list and you can tick the box, oh, well, I did that one, and I did that one, oh, but I haven't done that one. Oh, and that's much worse than that. And what we forget, those of us who have grown, I, I've grown up in church since, since I was a tiny wee baby, I was taken to church. I don't really know anything else. And sometimes we can say, well, I, I've never been that, I've never done that, and we think somehow that makes us better than other people. And the truth is, sin is sin. It doesn't matter how good we have been. Sin is sin, and God judges us the same, but God also forgives us the same. And God says, if you come to me, I will forgive you, and I will give you rest, and I will take away your burdens and your sorrows, and I will fill you with grace and mercy, and I will walk with you, and I will lead you and guide you by still waters. I'll take you to where there's food, and I'll take you to where there's wine, and I'll take you to where there's joy. And so, if I've done things that have not taken you to that place, then I'm sorry. Because I want us to get to that place where there is joy in coming to worship, because God is good, and His love endures forever. And it's made known in Christ. And today, we have to make it known to the world. Linda was at a conference last week, the week before, and somebody was asked about, what, what would you say to your big boss if you had the opportunity? And the response came back, where is your joy? You want people to be leaders? Look as if you enjoy it. You want people to come through? Look as if you enjoy it. Where is your joy? And so I suppose this morning the question is, where is your joy? Is your joy in Jesus? Because if it is, there's no hiding that. If it's not, then I would encourage you to go home and read the Gospels and find out more about Jesus. He is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. There is no one like him. He is worthy of our praise and our glory and honor. Amen.